Hi folks, welcome to the next question in the final exam review video and this one's on convertible bonds or convertible debt. So let's begin. We have three separate situations here that are independent and um, the short scenario is given so again make sure that you turn to the uh, uh, correct page number uh, in your uh, uh, notes or you're looking at the actual question with the solution so that you can uh, follow along uh, when I refer back to the uh, textbook uh, to review the question with you. So in the first case they tell you that we have a convertible bond and it was convertible in 15 years time into 78,000 common shares and this conversion was at the investor's option. So the investor has the choice as to whether or not they convert. So by definition, most of the time you're going to find that when the conversion of the bond into shares is at the investor's option, we need to divide the security, that's the convertible bond, into two pieces. We need to value the debt piece, which is the bond itself, and the equity piece because these investors have paid a premium in order to buy a bond that is convertible into common shares. The reason why some investors do this is because they can benefit from stock appreciation, which can happen in the stock market if the shares are doing well, and then perhaps they can earn a dividend um, if they have these bonds that allow them to convert some of their holdings, if not all of them, into common shares. By the same token, if those investors decided that they wanted to hang on to some of the bonds and only convert some of them to get the shares, they get the best of both worlds. They get a safer investment with the bond because at least the rate of return is known and they can even benefit from equity appreciation if they decide to convert part of those bonds. So again, to have this flexibility, especially if the conversion is at the issuer's option, the company has to, or the, the investor has to pay more. And in this case, we know that the investor has paid $5.2 million for this particular bond uh, in order to get a bond that is convertible into shares. So in this case, what we need to do is take the information that we're given and provide a journal entry on the date of issue, that is November 1st, 2001, and as well at the end of December of that same year, which is the end of the fiscal period. So the first thing we're going to do, this first entry up here is the November 1st entry. And in this entry, we're going to record the collection, the collection of cash from the investors and the issuing of this convertible debt. So as I said before, when conversion is at the investor's option, we need to divide that bond into two pieces, the equity piece and the actual liability piece. So we're going to use what we call the incremental method and value the liability first and the difference between the cash proceeds received for that security, which was $5.2 million, and the present value of the bond is going to give you uh, to give us the value of those conversion rights. So the conversion rights are part of your contributed capital, uh, which is in the um, equity section of the balance sheet. So now let's first of all calculate the value of the liability piece, so that we can use the incremental method and squeeze out, or calculate the equity as a residual. So now, why don't we use our calculators and calculate the present value? By putting in, we know the face value of the bond is $5 million, so that may have to be paid back. We don't know for sure, but it is at the investor's option. It's not the issuer's option. It's the investor's option. So therefore, because we don't know whether or not the investors will convert, when calculating the present value of the bond, we're going to in include the last cash flow at the maturity date of the bond, which could include a return of the cash to the investors. The, uh, the, um, by the cash, I mean the face value of the bond to the investors. The other thing we know we're going to have to do when we calculate the present value of the bond is we're going to have to calculate the present value of the annuity payment every period. And that's quite simply this 175000 is equal to 5 million, which is the face value, times the semi-annual interest rate. Well, we know the annual interest rate is 7% times a half. So this number here is 5 million 
times 0 0.07, which is the coupon, times a half because it's a semi-annual bond. We also know that the bond is a 30-year bond, or 15-year um, bond, but that means you have 30 periods. Don't forget, n is always going to be the number of periods for which you pay interest. The yield is given to us in the question as uh, uh, 8%, and then we can compute the present value of the bond, and we have the present value to be this. So therefore, in order to value the bond, we're going to set up the discount, the unamortized discount, which is the difference between the face value and the present value, which is 432.3, and then set up the bond. Notice that you have no gain or loss here. All you're doing is issuing a bond to the investors and valuing the bond at its present value separately from the equity, which is what the incremental method allows us to do. Now, on December 31st, which in fact is what? Two months after the issue of the bond, we now have to book our interest expense. We don't pay interest. We, only, uh, we don't pay ent interest on December 31st. You'll notice the, in the question, interest is paid semi-annually on November the 1st and May the 1st. So the next interest payment after the issue date would have been May the 1st of X2, but we're not there yet. They only want the entry for December 31st, X1 at this point. So let's do it. Now, calculate interest expense. Well, interest expense for the two-month period is going to be based on the present value of the bond that opens up the period that goes from November the 1st, X1, to May the 1st, X2. So now, this is the present value of the bond to open that period. But I only want to calculate my interest expense using the yield on that present value of the liability for two months. That's November and December. So I get 60903 So now I know that my interest payable, which is going to be based on my 7%, which is my coupon, is going to be 5 million times 7% a year. But I don't want it for one year. I want it for two months of one year which is going to give me 58,333. So therefore the discount that I amortized is the difference between the expense and the liability account and that's 2,570. So now we've concluded case A. Let's now look at a different case, case B, where case B deals with what we call a mandatory conversion. All that really means is that the investor is it's not at their option uh, whether or not they um, uh, convert the bond. Now it's at the issuer's option. So we consider this to be the same as a mandatory conversion. If you look at the question in case B, it says that the bonds are mandatorily convertible at the company's discretion. So mandatory conversion means that the company is now in the driver's seat and they can mandate whether or not the bond gets converted into shares. It's 99% of the time when it's at the issuer's option which is what we have in case B, it's almost always the case that they would force conversion because at the end of the period they probably wouldn't want to have to pay out all that cash. So therefore it is more likely that they would, that they would convert into shares. So therefore what do we do? Well because it's highly likely that they will and again it's at the issuer's option, what we do now is we calculate the value of the bond a little bit differently. We still have an equity piece as well as a liability piece, but now notice that because it's likely that we won't be paying back the uh, uh, face value of the bond at maturity, which is 10 million, our future value here is zero. So all we're doing to calculate the value of the liability, we would calculate, just as we did in case A, we would still calculate the present value of the interest payments, right? And we know we've got a $400,000 interest payment. How do we know that? Well, we know that the bond is a $10 million bond, the coupon payment is 8%, and the bond pays interest every six months. It's a semi-annual bond. It pays interest June 30th and December 31st. And this bond was issued on January 1st. So it's January to December year with interest being paid June 30th and December 31st. 
every six months. So therefore, I know that of an 8% coupon times a half because I pay interest twice a year, I know my payment is 400000 Again, I'm not valuing the cash flow at the end after all the interest payments are made because it's more likely than not that we're not going to have or the company is not going to make that $10 million payment. We know it's a 20-year bond, so that means our N is the number of interest payments, and that's 40. And again, we have our yield at 8. So computing our present value, we have seven million. $917,110. So again, using the incremental method as we did in case A, we're going to take the difference between the present value of the liability, which is just the present value of the interest payments, and subtract it from the cash proceeds we got from the investors when they bought this convertible bond. And we value the equity piece under the incremental method as $2,482,890. So the question asks you, how would these amounts show in the statement of financial position, which is the fancy name for balance sheet? We know under the long-term liability section, we would show the interest liability on the bonds at the present value of the bonds, but just based on the interest payment. And the equity piece is what we squeezed out using the incremental method in the equity section of the balance sheet. Now, the question also asks you to calculate in the year that this bond was outstanding, which is the entire year X1, how much interest expense would you book on your income statement or statement of earnings? So now what I've done is I've calculated this a couple of ways. Well, because we know the value of the interest payments or the present value of those interest payments was $7,917,110 at January the 1st of the current year, we need to know how much interest expense would have been booked in each six-month period, June 30th and December 31st, the six-month periods ending on those dates. Well, now, I know that for a half a year, that's my yield for a half a year, right, which is 8% for the year times a half is 4%. That was my liability to open the first six-month period. So I know that I would have expensed $316,684 in the first six month period. Now, how much interest would I expense in the second six month period of that first year? This is going to take a little bit of math, only because interest expense is booked on the liability. So you have to know what the value of the liability is at the end of the period. So now, what I did here is I said, well, I started my liability with this amount. My liability increased into the second period by the amount by which I booked interest expense because don't forget when you book an expense you increase a liability and then don't forget every six months I reduce my liability by paying the investors their interest payment so if I take four percent of that this bracket here simplifies to seven million eight hundred and thirty three thousand seven ninety two multiply the whole thing by four percent and this is my interest from July the 1st to December 31st of X1. Adding the two together over the two six-month periods gives me $630,036. If you're not sure and you don't like this more direct way of doing it, set up a short table. We know that at issue date, which was January 1st, X1, we already present valued the liability at $7,917,110. We know that over the first six-month period, January 1st to June 30th, we would have booked interest expense at 4%. 4% of the opening liability is this. Every time we pay interest, we're reducing our liability, so our ending liability winds up being this, right? So it's this amount that we use to calculate the interest expense for the second six-month period, and that ends December 31st. So now, if we have to calculate or show it a different way, if you're not sure uh, how this works when we make the interest payment, you can actually use this little table and make your journal entries. So why don't we try doing that? I'll just make it a little bit smaller so we can maybe see both of them at the same time. Okay, and here we are. We have the interest expense calculation for the entire X1 period here using straight math and here we have the table, right? If we can use this little table in tandem with the entries, 
we can see here that for this first six month period, which ends June 30th, I would have booked interest expense and credited a liability for the amount of the interest that I calculated up here, which is 316684 But then don't forget, this $400,000 payment during the year reduces the liability and credits cash. So if I net out from this 400000 316684 I can see that um, this is going to increase my liability and this is going to decrease my liability. So therefore, when I'm calculating my interest expense for the second six-month period, I have to factor in the fact that I'm calculating expense on the balance of the liability which is being reduced at the end of the first period, which is the period ending June the 30th, by 400000 So when I'm calculating my interest liability or my expense here based on 4%, I'm doing it based on the ending liability the period for the period ending June 30th, X1, of this amount. And that gives me 313352 just as you can see in the table. And therefore, my interest expense for the for the entire year, X1 is $630,036. So you can maybe practice that with a couple of more periods if you want. All right, and that concludes Case B. Now let's move on to Case C. And in Case C, it's a little bit different again as well. Case C says they're kind of taking you in the middle of the period here, and they are um, looking at a bond that has a present value of $5,442,798. And they already have convert, contributed capital on common share conversion rights. That's the right to uh, convert these bonds to shares. And those rights were valued at 107000 In this case, the only difference is that interest is not paid semi-annually. It's paid annually. All right. So what they want us to do is they now want us to make journal entries at October 31st, X2. And if you look at the question, the present value of the bond is given to us at October 31st, X1. So it's going to mature in three years from that time. So what we need to do is we need to now make the interest expense entry for that one year period that ends October 31st, X2. All right, so let's do that. We know that on October the 31st, X2, because our bond pays interest annually, that is in fact an interest payment date. So when I'm calculating my interest expense in case C, I'm going to use the value of the liability to open up that period for which I'm calculating interest expense, which is this 5,442,798. That was given to us in the question. And we also know that the yield for the year is 14%. And again, because we only have one annual interest payment here, one payment during the year and it's annual, and this bond was outstanding from October 31st, uh, well, our year ends October 31st, all right, we want to calculate the interest expense for a full year, and that 14% is our yield for the year, or our market rate for the year. The other thing we want to do is figure out how much cash we would have paid out. Well, we're given in the question that the face value of the bonds is six, $6 million, and our coupon, as in the question, is 10%. So therefore, I know I would have paid out 600000 in interest. So the difference between my interest expense and my payment is going to be the amount of the discount on the bonds. So that's how we would book our interest expense for the year. The next thing they ask us to do in requirement two of this case is they want us to assume that instead that the bond is um, issued on the open market. Oh, actually, I think I might be reading that wrong. Hang on a second. Yeah, the question here is still part of uh, requirement one in case C. They want us now to assume that on conversion, that the bonds were converted, all right, um, on that date. So what they would have done on October 31st, X2, is they would have booked the interest expense for the entire year that runs from November 1st, X1 to October 31st, X2, and then they would have converted the bonds. So they told you here that the market price of the shares was $11 a share on the date that the bonds were converted to shares. That's, that's irrelevant to us 
the fact that we know they've been converted, all we want to figure out is how many new shares are being created and what's the book value of those shares that we're going to record in our books as a result of this conversion. So we know that the entire thing was converted, so 6 million in bonds come off of our books and any remaining unamortized discount. Well, don't forget, for the year that ended October 31st, X2, of that discount that they gave you in the question, they gave you unamortized discount of 557,202 of which you just amortized up here 161,992. So this 395,210 is the amount of unamortized discount outstanding on the bonds just before they were retired and after the interest was expensed and paid. So therefore if they're converting right away we're going to credit or remove the discount by the full amount that it is not yet amortized and that's 395,210. We know that the bonds have all been converted, so the conversion rights come off the books. So therefore, using the book value method, we're going to value the shares at 5711790 Now, in Requirement 2, it's a different kind of question. They say to us now, assume instead that instead of the bonds being converted, the company decided to get rid of the bonds by buying them back from the investors. So this could be because maybe the company uh, wants to buy the bonds back. They may reissue them later because maybe they found cheaper sources of financing. So instead of paying these guys 10% in a coupon, maybe they can now finance that debt and only pay 6.5% or something, right? So they may go into the market, buy them back from the investors, and then at a later date they may decide to issue the bonds. We don't have that later date scenario in our question, but I'm just trying to explain why some companies may buy the bonds back before maturity. Well, in this case, what they did is in order to satisfy the investors, they paid the investors, from your question, $6,020,000 to buy back those bonds and take them off the marketplace. So now what would have happened? Well, when they take the bonds off the market, they're going to debit the bonds payable to get rid of the bonds payable, take them back. So they debit them by six million. We know that from the question we had when we booked the interest in part one, we would have done the same thing here in part two. They just didn't ask us to do it in part two. But even though we're buying them back in the open market, we would still expense and pay any interest owing to date. When we did that, you'll recall that we amortized a discount of 161.992. So the now the amortized discount on the bonds when we remove them from the market is 395.210. We've seen this number before, so it's here. The other thing we know is that since the bonds are all converted, we're taking the conversion rights off the books. So now what do we have? We know we would have debited bonds payable for this amount got rid of the conversion rights because they won't be exercised if the company is buying back the bonds and we know that we've got rid of this unamortized discount and we know we pay cash of six million twenty thousand dollars in order to buy those back from the investors so therefore we have two more numbers to figure out any gain or loss in the bond retirement as well as um, the value of the options that we retired so now in the question, they do give us enough money to, or enough information to calculate the money involved there. They tell us that of the six million twenty thousand dollars that was paid by the issuer to the investors, twenty five thousand of that relates to the options. Well, that's telling me that the fair value of those options must be twenty five thousand, right? So therefore, when I took the contributed capital and the conversion rights off of my books. I also want to credit the value of the options that expired or lapsed. They lapsed because they were never exercised before the company decided they were going to buy back the bonds. So the difference between the 107 that we took off our books and the 82,000 that we're crediting here would give us that $25,000 difference. Uh, this would be a net debit of 25000 which makes perfect sense to me because that's the fair value of the options. You want to now remove those options from your books 
at their fair value. So therefore, by crediting this contributed capital account, by crediting this contributed capital account for lapsed or retired conversion option for 82,000, net this number out against the 107 and you can see that at net we're debiting our contributed capital at its fair value which removes it from our books at fair value of 25,000. So therefore, we now have this number. So therefore, the loss on retirement can be plugged. It's the difference between the um, book value or present value of the bond, all right, the present value of the bond and the amount that the company has actually paid to retire the uh, convertible debt. So that will work out to $390,210. So now this concludes our presentation of question two in the review, convertible debt. Next thing we'll do is we'll look at stock appreciation rights.